Good morning, Standing Stones. It's great to be back together again. It is Sunday morning. It is time to worship. Now, next week, we will physically be back together. We have taken a few weeks off for everybody to get healthy, everybody to get strong, everybody to get ready to come back together. So we're going to have a few songs together. Dylan's going to lead us again this morning, and then we're going to come back. We're going to be in 1 Timothy. But next week, plan on being back in the seats, back in church, back in fellowship as we gather together physically. God bless you. We'll be back in a moment. Let's worship. Welcome Standing Stones. Will you please join me in worship?
you go, I'll go. Where you say I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow you. Whom you love, I love. How you serve, I'll serve. If this life I lose, I will follow you. We are back in 1 Timothy. Now, if you remember last week, the whole purpose of 1 Timothy, Paul left Timothy in Ephesus to pastor that church because he says they needed to be reminded of the truth. They needed to not wander away from the truth. So Timothy was left there to be the pastor of that church and to make sure that the truth was protected, the gospel was protected because there was false teaching and, and there was these things going on that were not honoring and glorifying the Lord. That was how 1 Timothy began. Now, everything from this point on, we get into the real life stuff. We get into Christian life. Paul says, make sure that the gospel is, is true, that the gospel is protected. He, he says, he entrusts you and I with the truth of the gospel, that we preserve it, that we protect it, that we preach it. Well, that means that we get into real life. So as we move along into, into 1 Timothy, as we get into chapter 2 and 3 and so on, we're going to find out that he's dealing with relationships, he's dealing with leadership, he's dealing with money. He's just dealing with the aspect of everyday life. So with that said, today we're going to talk about prayer a little bit, but what prayer really is. Have you noticed that if you really want to start a fight, if you really want to get an uproar, just begin praying. Go out in the public and begin to pray and see what kind of response you get. Why is there such response for Christian prayer? You can pray to other gods, you can pray to other things, and people won't be bothered. But you pray in Jesus' name, and that seems to cause chaos. Why is that? I, I remember the little story about the sign in the principal's office in the school. And, and the sign read, in the event of nuclear attack, fire, or earthquake, the ban on prayer is temporarily lifted. I bet it would be. If some kind of tragedy happened or chaos happened, well, we can then go to prayer. But besides with that, there really isn't much allowance for public prayer in the name of Jesus. Looking at some articles, April 16th of just last year, a court actually awarded an atheist group $456,000. They won a lawsuit against a South Carolina school district because the, the school held graduation ceremonies, and it included one hymn and a prayer. And they were sued for that, and they won against the school district. There is articles about a Minnesota school bus driver. He, he, if kids would get on the bus, and if they weren't feeling well, if something's going on, he would offer to pray for them. He would drive the bus and just pray for them. He was fired because of that. There's stories of a pharmacist, a, a female pharmacist who ha had a grieving customer came in. She was diagnosed with a, with a fatal disease, and, and, and she didn't know how long she had to live. And the pharmacist just gently touched her hand, held her hand, and prayed with her. She was fired for doing that, for praying with the customer. In Washington State, actually in a couple of states, high school football coaches have been fired because they prayed. In Washington State, the football coach there after the game, post-game, the game is over. He went by himself to the 50-yard line. He quietly just knelt down and prayed. Gave God thanks for godly competition and for protecting his players. Well, someone saw that and took a picture and filed a complaint, and he lost his job for that. In May, a, 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 su a, a church was sued because the church posted on their, their prayer chain, on their prayer board, that someone was ill and that person got upset and sued the church and won for putting them on public prayer, for asking for public prayer. You really want to start a battle? You really want to create chaos? Go out and pray in Jesus' name. Why is that? 
Why does that become the case? You know, the most important ministry, if not the most important ministry that we can have as a church, is prayer. Is honest, sincere, God-loving prayer. Charles Spurgeon, the great pastor, he said, I would rather teach one man to pray than ten men to preach. Think about that. I would rather teach one godly man how to pray than to teach ten how to preach. That's how important prayer is. That's what we get into as we get into 1 Timothy chapter 2. Why should we pray? Why is it so important? The ultimate goal of prayer is to advance the gospel. The purpose of 1 Timothy is to protect the gospel. As Paul says to Timothy, and he's, as Paul says, God has entrusted us with his word. We have been entrusted with this. So because of that, we have to understand the truth of it and protect the truth. The purpose of prayer is to advance the gospel. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus gives two criteria for righteous, godly prayer. He says the first one should be done not so that other people look at you and go, wow, look how spiritual that person is. You're not supposed to pray like the Pharisees where people look at you and, and are amazed at your prayer time. Your prayer is supposed to be done where, where God gets the glory, where God gets the honor, not where you're seeking attention from people. Oftentimes, my prayer time is it's between me and God. I don't even tell people. People ask me, how often do you pray? I don't, I don't put a time on it. I just pray throughout the day. People will come to my mind. Something will come to my mind. Something will happen. I'll get some news. You know, and I'll just take a, a brief moment. And I'll just bow my head and just ask the Lord for, for guidance and for wisdom. And I, I begin praying. No one knows about that. No one needs to know about that. Same when you pray. That, that's one criteria that, that Jesus himself talks about in Matthew 6, verse 5 to 7. The other one means that the prayer time, it should be authentic from the heart. It should be sincere. When we say, Lord, your will be done, then we better be ready to say, Lord, your will be done. Not what I want. Now, that would transition us really into 1 Timothy chapter 2. Because part of what it comes down to is we kind of want what we want. We want it the way we want it, when we want it, how we want it. And we can take the Bible, we can take Scripture, and we can kind of twist it around to say, this is what I want. This is my heart, my desire. And we'll use the Scripture to validate that. Well, that kind of gets blown out of the water when you look at 1 Timothy chapter 2. First of all, then, I urge that requests, prayers, intercessory, and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all people. Verse 2, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. So we should be praying for everybody. That's we pray for everybody. This is why. The so that is the why. Verse 4. I'm sorry, verse 3. This is good and acceptable in, in the sight of God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's God's desire for everybody to come to the knowledge of truth. People are going to reject it, but God's desire, his heart, is for all to know. For, <clears throat> verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind. That man is Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at this proper time. For this I was appointed as a preacher and as an apostle. I'm telling the truth. I'm not lying. And as a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Paul saying this is why. For this reason. What reason? The fact that Jesus died on the cross and paid the price so that we all could be saved, so that the world could be saved. For that reason, God has called me a preacher, an apostle, a sent one, a messenger, and a teacher. Same reason he's called you and I. So that the gospel is protected, God's word is protected, and it's, it's handled properly and righteously. As we go through this, the word therefore began, first of all, or therefore, or then, depending on what version of scripture you have, it bumps us back to the very first chapter which again is the purpose of protecting the truth, being entrusted with the gospel. How you live it, how you understand it, and how you share it. 
therefore refers us back to that chapter. And, and Paul begins to move from general instructions into a more detailed instruction, into real life. How should our relationships be? How should leadership be? How should it be in the household? What, how should we handle our money? What we, top, what we will touch upon all those topics as we work our way through 1 Timothy. Now, I urge you that request, prayers, intercessory, and thanksgiving. What, what a, why are those four things broken down the way they're broken down? What's the difference here? See, a petition is, is a supplication. This is something that we lay before the Lord. Uh, the root word here means to, to be without, meaning I, I have no control. Lord, I, I, I need your intervention. I need you to provide this. I need you to take care of this. I need you to handle this. So our, our petition, our supplication, our requests are laid before the Lord. And, and then to, to, to do this righteously, to do this in a God-honoring way, then what we do is we say, you know what, I'm okay with whatever direction you go, Lord, whatever the outcome may be. It may not be what I'm looking for or what I want, but we're going to accept that and be okay with it, whichever way you decide to work it out, Lord. And it says our, our prayers, you know, our, our prayers is, is, is to be not just filler, but it's supposed to be meaningful conversation. God wants to communicate with us. Our prayer time can be just in communication with the Lord. We don't always have to be asking for things. You know, sometimes I'll go into prayer time and I'll just be quiet. And I say, Lord, I just, I just want you to know I love you. Lord, I just want you to know I, I just want to serve you. Lord, I just want you to know I'm available for wh whatever you may want. And just have some meaningful conversation. That's really what the word prayer is about. And then you have intercessory. Do you realize the book of Romans tells us that, that the Holy Spirit intercedes for us, that, God, that Jesus is in heaven now interceding for us, meaning on our behalf, he's praying for us. Romans says when we don't know what to pray, when we don't know how to pray, the Holy Spirit will intercede for us. The Holy Spirit will kind of give us the words, give us the direction. You know, that's why sometimes I'll sit at my desk or I'll be on my car or I'll be even outside just by myself sometimes and, and, and I'll just be quiet. And I'm waiting for the Holy Spirit to say, pray this way. Think about that. And people's faces or mine, you know, or names will come to my mind. I say, okay, I'm going to pray for that person. And I have no idea what's going on. Oftentimes I have no idea. And I'm in the habit now when I pray for somebody, I'll send a text or something and say, hey, I just finished praying for you. And I'm going to trust that, that they know why they're you know, on my heart or mind, that God is working behind the scenes. And I'm just trying to be faithful. And the seating. Let your prayers, your requests, your supplications, and your intercede, your intercession. And the last one that Paul mentioned here is thanksgiving. Uh, thanksgiving, believe it or not, revolves around holiness. It's more than just gratitude. It, it, it's acknowledging that all that we have, all that we are, everything that about us is only because of God's grace. Uh, to be thankful is, you know, thank you for placing us here. Thank you for this church. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the relationships that we have. Thank you for everything that you've done for us, Lord. And it's just being full of thanksgiving. So Paul says, first of all, I urge, I urge you that your requests, your supplications, your prayers, your intercession, and your thanksgiving be made on behalf of all people. Well, that answers the question, well, who should I be praying for? Who should we be praying for? Everybody. We should be praying for everybody especially those who are in leadership. Now, this becomes, <laughs> especially now, it, this becomes hard sometimes. It, the Scriptures does not say that we have to agree with the people we're praying for. The Scriptures do not say we have to come alongside and say amen to the leaders. We don't. We just need to pray for them. Don't need to agree with them. But our responsibility, what God's going to hold you and I accountable for is, are we covering them in prayer? Because those in leadership, we have to understand and trust that God put them in leadership. Now, they have a, a, a burden to carry because they have to now go to the Lord and, and do and lead the way that God says lead. And if they go in opposite direction, they will be held accountable by the Lord for that. So our prayer time I don't agree with this leadership. I don't agree with the direction this is happening. But I'm going to pray for them 
because they're going to be held accountable. That's what God says we are to do here. That any decision they make, any direction they go, that they're seeking the Lord on it. And it may work, it may not work, but that's between them and God. But our job, your job, my job, our responsibility to stand before the Lord is to say I prayed for them. I prayed they would do the right thing and I prayed that they would make the right choices. Not on what they want, but on what Scripture says and what the Lord wants. So that's the who Paul was asking to. And, and, the, and the thing about this is we can look around. It, it's a, our, our world, as we all know, is, is so upside down right now. The United States, we're not united. Um, just what's going on, what happened in the Capitol, what's happening in the streets, what's happening. It, it's just, it's heartbreaking. But understand when Paul said this, when this was written, who was the leader of the time? He was talking about the Romans, especially the Roman emperor. And if you understand church history, at this time, around this period, the Roman emperor was out to literally kill Christians, to torture them. He was literally out to, to wipe out the Christians. And then Paul says, no, pray for him. He'll be held accountable. Pray for him. So no matter what leadership we look at, whether it be national, local, agree with them, don't agree with them, be upset, not be upset, our job is to pray. And if Paul can ask the Christians in the time of Timothy in Ephesus and Corinth and Thessalonica, all around the area, to pray for the Roman emperor, then we have no excuse or reason not to be praying for our leadership as well. Because trust us, we, we, we need that done now. Why pray? Well, the scripture says, so that we can live in, in peace, tranquility, that our lives can be calm and quiet. That's why we're praying. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to, to live in peace. And we're going to pray for our leadership, and we're going to pray for world leaders because we want the door of ministry to be kept open. If we're not praying for world leaders, if we're not praying for, we pray for Christians, I think, I trust that we're praying for Christians that we hear stories of how they're being persecuted just because they're Christians. Are we praying for the leadership of those nations? Because the doors can be closed. Missionaries can be sent home. Visas can be denied. The gospel, the purpose of this, of prayer, is so the gospel is advanced. The purpose of 1 Timothy is for the gospel to be advanced. And if we're not praying for world leaders, if we're not praying for countries who are against Christians and against the Bible and against the Lord, then ministry can halt. And, and God's saying, be in prayer. That visas are granted. That doors are open. What's happening in China? The underground church, they're still preaching. They're still, we need to pray that the leadership backs off. And other, uh, Iran, other places in the world that we may never even set foot in. But we need to be praying for them. For the sake of the advancement of the gospel. Now, 1 Timothy 2, jumping down to verse 8. That, that was the very beginning. The verse 8 is the second part. And it's more, again, instructions as we move through Timothy. This is going to be interesting, especially for the ladies, because the ladies can oftentimes be offended by what we're going to read in 1 Timothy 2. But you have to understand it in context and the purpose behind it. And gentlemen, please point out and please understand that God speaks to you before he speaks to the ladies. So guys, we're on the hot seat first. God is speaking very directly to us as we do this. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. Therefore, everything we just said, we're praying for our leaders, we're praying for righteously, we're praying correctly. Therefore, I want the men in every place to pray, to lift up holy hands without anger and dispute. Likewise, verse 9, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modesty, discreetly, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or expensive apparel, but rather by means of good works as it's proper for women, making a claim to godliness. Verse 11, a woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submission, but I do not allow a woman to teach 
or to exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. There's where the women get upset. Verse 13, for it was Adam who first was first created, and then Eve. And it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a wrongdoer. But women will be preserved through childbirth if they continue in faith, love, and sanctity with moderation. Now, what is happening here? Well, why do women need to be silent and quiet? And why can't they teach? And why is this all about women? And why? Is... Time out. As we said, we don't want to make the gospel what we want it to be. And verse 8, before he speaks to the ladies, he speaks to the men. And men, what does he say? And he's not talking about mankind. He talks about men, males. What does he say in verse 8? That we are to be the spiritual leaders that we are to be the ones in prayer, that we are to be the ones lifting holy hands, hands that we can lift to the Lord and say, cleanse me, make me pure. We're, we're, we're taking our hands and we're giving them to God. Our palms are turned up. The men are being the spiritual leaders. If the men become the spiritual leaders, then the women are to come alongside them. But what happens when the men don't lead? What happens when the men aren't praying? What happens when the men are not lifting holy hands? Then that burden then is placed on the woman. And what Paul is saying, what the Lord is saying here is that's not a burden. That's not the structure that he has put into place. Understanding context. Paul says to pray by lifting holy hands. Not the first time we see that in Scripture. In 1 Kings chapter 8. Solomon, his prayer of dedication. Verse 22, Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in front of the whole assembly of Israel, and he spread out his hands towards heaven. And Solomon began to pray. We see it in Psalm 28. Hear my cry for mercy as I call to you for help, as I lift my hands towards your most holy place. Psalm 63, verse 4. I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift my hands. Psalm 134. Lift your hands in the sanctuary and praise the Lord. You know, we're going to end with the song very shortly here. And, and you're at home or you're, you're somewhere else. Next week, you'll be here, hopefully. But wherever you're at, I want you to start lifting your hands. It's biblical. It's commanded in Scripture. Next week when we're together, we're back in this facility, we're back in church together, we'll be lifting holy hands and saying, Lord, Lord, I come before you properly, righteously. That's the call that's being made here. Now, understand, you may or may not understand that in this day, that was a posture that pagans used, Jews used, and Christians used. The question is, when you lift your hands, what's inside your heart? Why are you lifting your hands? Is it for show? It, 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 well, what, what's the purpose of lifting the hands? If you're acknowledging who he is, and if you're worshiping him, then that's different than the other ways of worshiping or of having hands lifted. To this day, the Jews, before they pray, they will ceremonially go and wash their hands because they want to have pure hands before they go to prayer. Over in Israel, at the Western Wall, one of the, one of the most holy sites that the Jews have, they go and they will pray before the wall. You, you leave notes in the wall. And, but before you get there, there's a wash basin. And, and you are to take the cup of water and you're to wash your hands before you go and pray. Why? So your hands are pure. So when you lift your hands, the Jews say they want their hands to be physically clean so that they can be spiritually clean. God's saying that we need to lift holy hands. Now, women should be praying too. And, and Paul does not say that women shouldn't be. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 11, he talks explicitly about women praying. We may think that there is a, a problem in Ephesus. And it could, it's still a problem today. But there, many people think in Ephesus there's a problem where the women were praying and the men weren't. No, that couldn't be. 
Yeah, the women would gather for prayer. The women would be praying, but the men were kind of absent in Ephesus. Does it happen in Phoenix? Does it happen in America? Guys, we need to step up because God's calling us to. We lift holy hands. And it's not really a posture of the hands. It's a posture of the heart on why we're doing this. Uh, Paul's, that's Paul's primary point. What is the heart? Verse 9 to 15 says about women. That a woman should learn in quietness. Not silence, but quietness. Uh, Paul just says this. What he's saying is that he's not going to permit for a man or a woman to do what they want to do. Well, this is how I feel it should be done. Well, this is what I want. I'm just going to gripe about the leadership. I'm going to gripe about the pastor. I'm going to do what I want to do. Paul say, no, that's not God honoring. That is not defending and protecting and advancing the gospel. When he says that, as far as teaching, there's been times in Scripture where Paul said women should be teaching. I had, I've had women in the course of my, my career in ministry come to me and say, but I have the spiritual gift of teaching. What do I do with it? Then you teach. The question is, who are you teaching? The primary responsibility falls on the men. You know, a few weeks ago when we began this year, I said, I want you to have one word. And I'm still waiting to hear from that one word from some of you. What is that one word we're going to focus on so that we don't get off track? We're going to stay. And I said, my word this year is warfare. And it's not about a you know, physical battle. It's about spiritual battle. Because there's so much going on in our country and our lives. What would happen in a physical war if, if a battle broke out and the general led his troops out there? And when he got there, if the general just kind of stood and watched. The troops are waiting for a commandment. The troops are waiting for direction. And the general just stood and watched. And one of the soldiers say, General, there's a, there's a battle. What do we do? And he said, Yeah, there's, there's a battle out there. What would happen? What would happen if a fire broke out? And, and the, the fire truck showed up. And, and the, the fire captain got out of the fire truck. And he just looked and he, he watched the buildings burning. And, and the, the trucks and the firemen, everybody's waiting for direction. You know, which, which troops go in here and who goes over there and what do we do? And the fire captain just stood there and watched. Well, that wouldn't work in battle with the general and that wouldn't work with the fire captain at a fire. The leader needs to lead, needs to give direction. You go this way, you take that way, we'll work together, we'll get this accomplished, we will achieve the goal. That's what he's calling men to do in the family. Guys, step up. Be the leader. Don't just sit back and watch. Take the direction. Well, I'm not ready for that then. Then come see me. I will work with you. If there is a man out there that says, I want to do this, but I don't know how, come see me. Talk to me. We'll do it together. We'll do it as a group. I, I will stand side by side with you and, and, and do everything I can to set you up to succeed. But you've got to be willing to lead. That was not happening in Ephesus. Silence. The woman should be silence. Well, what does that mean? It's used other times in Scripture. Look to see when it's used elsewhere in Scripture. It just means to be quiet. To not cause chaos. To not cause gossip. To not cause disruption. Just to have a tranquil, quiet life. Does that not mean I can't speak my mind? Depends how you speak it. Sometimes we don't need to speak our minds. Sometimes we just need to pray. Again, we're getting into the nitty-gritty here because the whole purpose is to advance the gospel and to make sure the gospel is handed properly. To lead a quiet and peaceful life. That kind of gives you the tone of what the word means when he says that women should be silent or quiet in church. It's really what's built around is having a life to be content. It's a life of contentment. And where God has you. Teaching. I do not permit women to teach, Paul says. However, if you look at Titus chapter 2, verse 3, it's the older women who are to teach the younger women. They are to teach. In fact, it says they are to teach what is good and to train the younger women, younger women to love their husbands and their children. 
And in 2 Timothy 3, when we get there, he's going to remind Timothy. Timothy, how were you brought up? How were you trained? Who taught you? It was his mother and his grandmother that taught Timothy the scriptures. Because his father was, was not a believer, was not, was not in the picture. That's according to Acts. What about Priscilla in, in Acts 18? When her and her husband heard Apollos, they took him aside and expounded to him the way of God more accurately. Meaning that the, the husband and wife worked together as a team. And, and they mentored and trained someone who was young in the Lord. So women are teaching women. Women are teaching children. Women wives are working with their husbands to, to mentor and to work together. That's all teaching. It's all godly. It's all how God's calling us to be. Now, there's a high possibility that the women in Ephesus were being misled, that the women in Ephesus were trying to teach, and they were teaching pagan traditions, or they were teaching false doctrine, or they were teaching something that just got off the way. The false teachers were in the church. The whole book is about false teaching and not following a wayward way, but being, being honest and being right and preserving the Word of God. And in Ephesus, history tells us that the women went in a different direction. They were deceived by false teachers. And they took that false teaching. They took that false concepts and they brought it into the church. Paul's saying, understand the purpose. But before, the, the ones who would get upset with this passage are usually the ladies. Because what people, when they read this, what they hear, the women hear, so I got to be quiet and I've got to be submissive and I got to be this. And Focus first on what he says in verse 8. Gentlemen, men, stand up, lead, be a prayer warrior, lift holy hands, not dirty hands, holy hands. Well, my hands aren't so holy. Then make sure they get washed. Come before the Lord, repent, be sincere, and lift your holy hands and lead your family. And ladies, honestly, if you're married, if your husband is leading that way, are you going to rebel? I isn't that what you want? If you're a single lady, your father, if your father is leading you that way, are you going to rebel? Uh, that, that's what this picture is about. It's about being quiet. It's about being, having peace. It's about having tranquility. It's about having righteousness. And if we get upset because we're not getting what we want, I would encourage you to take a step and say, time out. Time out. What is it that God's asking me to do? Oh, isn't that fun stuff? See, I love these kind of passages because it, it gets real. It gets into our kitchen. This gets into real life stuff. And, and folks, all we need to do now is understand the purpose of 1 Timothy, which is to be entrusted with God's word and to live as righteous. Men step up and lead. Women come alongside. There's peace. There's tranquility. And there's the ability to then present the gospel to a world that's full of chaos, pain, and they're lost. And it says that God's desire is that all, that all, and all means all, and that's all all means, that all, come to know him. Unfortunately, we know there will be people who reject him. But that's not the purpose, that we are praying and living the lives that God has called us to live. All right, it's time to close out. It's time to do one more song. Wherever you're at, let me challenge you. Lift holy hands and let's worship the Lord together. Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you that we can physically come back together as a church next week. I pray for those who are online and can't be here. I pray for those who, who are just hearing this for the first time. But Lord, I pray that you penetrate their heart in a way that only you can do. Lord, I pray that we can put down all kinds of gossip and grievance and upset and everything that we want to carry around, all this junk that we have, that we can just let go of it and throw it away and say, what kind of person does God want me to be? Your word is very clear. If it wasn't so clear, we wouldn't get upset over it sometimes. But it is very clear. You give us direction. And Lord, I pray now that each of us can take that direction, apply it, 
live it, not for our benefit, but for your glory. May we all lift holy hands with our hearts being pure, saying, Lord, thank you. May our prayers, our supplication, may everything we do be given to you. And whatever may come, may we accept it as the work of your hand, knowing that we do not have the whole picture, we do not see clearly, but you do. Father, thank you. Thank you for embracing us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for your grace. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. God bless you. See you guys next week.